Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. The Earth continued to evolve chemically. It continued to differentiate. A few impacts would continue for a while before accretion wound down to nothing. But the bigger impacts, the, the world-changing impacts, appear to have been over at that point, at least for a while. So the Earth, left alone, begins to chemically differentiate. It would have already begun doing so, and then Thea impact would have reset that. But every large object that's a terrestrial rocky object in our solar system probably went through something very similar to this. Any large asteroid like Ceres or Vesta, uh, the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, of course Earth, are all rocky objects with a high metal content and low content of, of light volatiles. So we would have formed as a essentially a homogeneous mass of stuff that in, in what order it hit us, stacking up to form a planet. But it's not going to stay that way. It's going to start chemically differentiating, and its lighter material is going to be, through buoyancy, rising through the mass of the Earth to the, to the exterior. And the heaviest materials are going to sink by their being denser than the surrounding material to the Earth's center of gravity. So metal is going to sink to the core. The Earth's light volatiles are going to be boiling out of the interior. And that's going to include all the primordial gases, hydrogen, helium, uh, light volatiles like water vapor, CO2, methane, ammonia. Those are all going to be boiling out and forming a hot, superheated, really, atmosphere. Because the atmosphere at that point is also going to contain vapor from low melting point, low boiling point silicates. It's that hot. It's thousands of kelvins. And it's cooling. In the interior, metal sinks toward the core. Lighter silicates rise toward the outer part of the planet. Iron nickel is going to sink toward the center, as I just said, because it's denser, but also because it's, its mass as magma is not blending with the silicate magma. Iron magma and silicate magma don't mix, like oil and water. And so both in the same environment, the same setting inside the Earth, will essentially travel past each other. As the surface cools and solidifies, water vapor will eventually be able to condense as a liquid and rain out and begin covering parts of the Earth. The oceans will begin to form. The surface, once accretion stops, is going to eventually cool down. Water vapor, originally superheated, starts to form the oceans. The remaining atmosphere would be mostly nitrogen, some methane, ammonia, and carbon dioxide. No oxygen yet. Until uh, photosynthesis evolves, there won't be any free oxygen in the atmosphere. So as the crust forms and the oceans begin to pool on the surface, core formation continues. As the core builds up liquid iron and the planet in general cools, and this, was, this, this part's going to happen over the, the next few hundred million years after accretion, but slowly as the crust and the, the outer parts of the Earth solidify and the oceans fill up, solid crystals of iron nickel begin to form in the core. Because at the core of the Earth, in the center of the Earth, it's very hot, but it's also the highest pressures attainable inside the Earth. And these extreme pressures are high enough that they force the iron nickel to lock into a solid lattice state, to, to form a solid at those high pressures. And so solid iron nickel begins to accumulate as rubble forming a larger and larger solid iron core inside the Earth until we become a differentiated body eventually with a solid iron nickel inner core, uh, outer core of liquid iron, and a mantle of silicate rock and a crust of silicate rock surrounding that. Eventually, the interior of the Earth settled into the layers that are familiar to us today. The inner core. Earth's inner core has a radius of about 1,200 kilometers, and it's hot. It's close to the temperature of the surface of the sun and it's composed of iron-nickel alloy, primarily iron with a few percent nickel, and smaller amounts, uh, commensurately, of heavy elements that tend to travel in a metallic form or with metal. So gold, silver, platinum, uh, lead, things like that will tend to accumulate in the core and partition, preferentially, in the core material of iron uh, and not into uh, silicate material. The outer core is liquid iron-nickel, essentially the same composition as the inner core. 
there may be some segregation of trace elements uh, from one to the other. But for our purposes, we can think of the inner core and the outer core as having the same composition of mostly iron with smaller amounts of nickel, a few percent of nickel, and maybe a very small amount of sulfur or oxygen. It's not clear. The temperature at the outer edge of the outer core is about 3,000 Kelvin. Its radius is about 3,500 kilometers. And because the inner core is hotter than the outer core, the outer core receives heat from the inner core's solid mass and convex. It's heated from below, so the outer core convex quite vigorously to the point where the motion of liquid iron against the solid iron of the core sets up a, a dynamo. It's essentially like an electrical generator where magnets move past each other and that motion sets up an electromagnetic field. The motion of the outer core with respect to the inner core sets up the geodynamo of Earth, Earth's magnetic field. It's generated constantly, dynamically within this inner outer core arrangement. It's not like a bar magnet where the Earth is a magnetized object. The, the magnetic field is actively generated inside the Earth. As you ascend out of the outer core, you move from an ocean of liquid iron magma to solid rock, to silicate rock that overlies the outer core. Silicate rock in the mantle is heavy and dense. It's rich in iron and magnesium silicate minerals. It's denser than continental crust by far. And yet it's not as dense as the core iron beneath it. So by buoyancy, our mantle of silicate rock rides above this liquid inner layer of molten metal. The radius of the mantle is about 6,500 kilometers. The temperature ranges from about 800 kelvins and the outer layers of the mantle to 1,200 kelvins or so as you go further in. Riding above the mantle is the Earth's crust. The Earth's crust is made up of somewhat lighter silicates, less dense silicates than the mantle. I'll give you more information about the details of how the crust compositionally is put together later on. But for now, I can simplify it to say that the Earth's crust is composed of two major kinds of crust, chemically different. The ocean crust, which is made of denser basaltic rock, uh, iron magnesium rich silicates that are less dense than mantle rock. The ocean crust is only about five to 10 kilometers thick. It's much thinner than the continental crust. The continental crust is much thicker than the ocean crust. It's 30 to 50 kilometers thick. And it's different in composition. It's less dense. It's made of lighter rock, granite, uh, more silica rich, less magnesium and iron in the rock and more aluminum, calcium, sodium, potassium. The continental granitic rock is less dense than ocean crust. Filling the low places of our planet's surface are the oceans. Seawater contains about 35 grams per liter salts, primarily sodium chloride, but not exclusively. There are many other mineral elements in there dissolved in the water, but about 35 grams per liter. And that's not coming from washing off uh, from the rivers from continents. Most of that salt comes from weathering reactions with seafloor crust, with basaltic rock on the ocean floor. Seawater over the eons has reacted with basaltic ocean crust and reached an equilibrium composition. And based upon inclusions of tiny bits of seawater in rock from, from early in Earth's history, we know that the oceans have essentially always been as salty as they are now. Over the oceans and the surface of the Earth, of course, is the atmosphere. Our atmosphere has evolved from its original state. Originally, it would have been mostly nitrogen, CO2, a little bit of methane, ammonia. The hydrogen would have been long lost to space. Uh, hydrogen is the lightest element. It, it easily just wanders off from an atmosphere into space. Today, our atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen, about 21% oxygen. All of that is produced from photosynthesis by bacteria and green plants. About 1% of our atmosphere is argon, and that may seem kind of random, but no, argon, we don't breathe that, we don't use it biologically, it's a noble gas. But the decay of potassium in rocks of the Earth's crust results in the production of argon. Potassium, radioactive potassium-40, decays to argon-40. So a little bit of argon is always in our atmosphere, and it's harmless, and we don't really notice. Today, the concentration of CO2 is a lot lower than it used to be when Earth formed. Uh, it's around 400 parts per million currently. 
it's not clear what the CO2 concentration was just after accretion or at Earth's earliest uh, episodes, but it was almost certainly much higher than today, possibly 2% level concentrations. It is a volcanic gas and Earth's earliest atmosphere, uh, not the primordial atmosphere of hydrogen and helium, but Earth's earliest intrinsic atmosphere boiled out from the interior and retained would have contained volcanic gases primarily. Water vapor, CO2, nitrogen. The water vapor condenses to form oceans. The nitrogen is still here in the atmosphere. And the CO2, which has continued to boil out from the interior of the Earth in volcanoes over geologic time, uh, most of that today is in limestone and sedimentary rock. 